Okay, everyone, at seven, um, and we have a lot to cover, so I think we should get started. Uh, please mute your phones or mute your um, mute your recorders and mute your videos. Can everybody hear me? Okay, um, welcome everyone to Hub Cycling's Advocacy Workshop. I'm Kathy Kuna, the Community Manager for Hub Cycling. I'm the liaison between the local committees and the Hub Main Office. Also with us from Hub are Laura Jane, Hub's newly appointed Executive Director, Navdeep China, Hub's Director of Campaigns and Inclusion, Rose Gardner, Director of Education, Evan Hammer, Infrastructure and Planning and Policy Manager. And we also have uh, with us several Hub Board of Directors, including Jeff Lee, Alicia Gowan, Marin Shields-Brown, Victoria Gray, and Luke Gillies. You're all here because you're either part of our local committees or interested in bike advocacy. And a special welcome to the guests from Victoria Capital Bikes. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here and also for all the work you're doing in your neighborhoods to help us and uh, Metro make Metro Vancouver a safer place to bike. Just a few housekeeping suggestions before we start. Please leave your microphones muted unless we call on you. You'll have a chance to unmute yourself and show your screens um, during the breakout sessions. You can also use the chat to comment or ask questions of our speakers. We'll relay all your questions to the three speakers during our Q&A session. Um, if you are with a local committee, please add your municipality after your name. And before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that the land from which I'm joining on and from which Hub delivers many of our programs is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We honor and respect the land, the waters, and all the living beings that call it our home and on which we run our programs. Um, here is the agenda slide for tonight. We're hoping that this session will guide your committees in becoming even more effective advocates than you already are. The three speakers will be focusing specifically on their experiences of working with advocacy groups or local government, and we'll be sharing their insights into what makes effective advocacy campaigns. And um, if the speakers have time, and it would be great if they could also share a bit about budgeting process, just because that's what we will be focusing on in our workshop at the end. Again, uh, as we move through the presentations, please post your questions to the speakers in the chat, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. So our first speaker tonight is Councillor Tony Valente, who brings a unique combination of skills, experience, and passion to his role as Councillor in the City of North Vancouver. He's a big proponent of public spaces for people um, to enjoy their cities and streets. And he was a founding member of the direct and, and director of North Van Urban Forum, which is a nonprofit addressing urban issues and encouraging consultation and transparency on the North Shore. Tony was also part of the branding committee resulting in lot five becoming the shipyards. Tony's other passion is for presentation and as former chair of the Hub Cycling North Shore Committee, as well as in a variety of other local volunteer roles, he has worked with the community on cycling infrastructure and safety improvements for all ages and abilities, as well as e-bikes, ride sharing, and a variety of other active transportation issues. Over to you, Tony. Thanks very much, Kathy. I'm just gonna try to share my screen here, so bear with me as I do this. Um, one second. Break my door. All right, can folks see that? Yeah, we can see that. And just a reminder to everybody who's in the meeting to turn off their videos and their microphones, except for Tony. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much for your time tonight. And today I'm gonna to share some perspectives with you. And I think the suggestions and, and the things I'm sharing with you here are uh, based as much as possible on uh, what's realistic uh, in the local government, but also based on observations I've made either as an advocate with Hub in the past or other community organizations, and then, uh, of course, my experience as a counselor. Um, and I wanted to give you three things in this presentation tonight. I've only got about 10 minutes, so uh, we'll pack them in here. Um, but the first is I want, I want to help you understand how to connect with your local elected officials. I think it works actually at all levels, but, but especially targeted to city council. And I want to give you some idea about how you time your actions. And this is really focused on the local level budgeting process. And then I want to give you some ideas uh, for those actions. So I'm just gonna move to the next slide here. So I think there's a single principle in terms of how you connect with elected officials. And I think that one is probably that 
realizing that they're people too. They have feelings, they care about how they're perceived by the public, um, and perhaps most importantly, their opinions are shaped by their lived experiences, which is often guiding the decisions that they make. And so what I would suggest to you is that you want a relationship with them. It's really critical to understand this. So whether you like their politics or not, you need to keep working on that relationship because that relationship is really the connection um, in the way that um, you'll be able to help them move, out, move outside of their lived experience, even if they don't gravitate right away to your cause. And I think understanding that means that um, you're gonna have to take patience and help them walk along with you and, and help them understand cycling and why it's important. And, and I know like as, as an advocate as well, um, you know, for special people, it's not easy to have a vision for the, a better future, uh, which is what you're trying to do through your work with Hub. And so sometimes it's frustrating because projects aren't advanced or they're not advanced fast enough. Um, but I think if you can make that relationship connection, you're gonna get the results. Um, specifically, one thing I did wanna say is I know from experience that lots of projects get built. They don't necessarily come out perfect, uh, maybe on the first attempt. And I think the temptation can be to point out the flaws immediately, but I think there's huge power in actually um, focusing on the positive aspects of what gets done and then going back to work on the flaws. And I think that's, that means taking a focus like on, on the long game and, and putting that relationship piece first um, and then coming back to get those things fixed. So now you're ready to, to reach out to council. And so how do you do that? Well, every city council has their contact info. Um, and I, I would want to point this out, and this is kind of snipped from the city's website, but basically you've got addresses for email, but also phone numbers. Um, so that, that's obviously the most direct answer to that question. But as council, we get a lot of emails. And I think this next picture here is actually where you want to get to, which is a coffee chat. Email is really easy to ignore. And um, I have to be honest, if you want your counselors to understand your perspective, um, I think use the email maybe to get to that coffee chat meeting. If it's something simple that you want from them, like supporting a notice of motion, email's great for that in terms of just saying in the subject line, hey, I support this notice of motion. But if the message you're trying to convey is something more than just 10 lines, uh, 10 lines like that you could write out, um, maybe call them and ask for a coffee um, or, or, or uh, use the email to get to that coffee chat. I kind of make, like when I think about this for you guys, for you all, I'm thinking about like a hierarchy of connection. So email, you know, the relationship building potential not really there. Phone call definitely says it's urgent, um, but you want to get to the point where you're having that in-person meeting because that's the way that you're going to be able to connect with them, build the relationship, and then be remembered. Um, I will say maybe just a couple thoughts about meeting them in person. You want to be adapting your messages to the specific counselors. So if you know people in common um, that they know, tell them that because that's going to help them remember and build that connection. Um, if maybe like they're, you know that they're really into curling and, and you go curling, get talking about that to build that initial rapport. Your whole goal there is really um, trying to come across as the like reasonable and dedicated person that's focused on making the community a better, a better place. I know that sounds a bit weird, but um, when you're on council, like you will get people just basically shouting orders at you sometimes, um, and then sometimes calling you like the next week and wondering why things haven't changed. So, um, and we're gonna get to the timing of how we have, how, how you can ask for things most effectively with, with the budgeting process. Um, but I think ultimately you're trying to help them understand your perspective, tell them the story about why you care, why you got involved and why you're trying to push for this change. Okay, I'm just gonna to move to the next slide. So this is the timing your action. So now you've got a relationship with them, you've made them aware of your concerns, but of course nothing happens if there's no money to support it. So um, every city is actually required to have a financial plan and I'm gonna explain how this process works. But I wanna tell you right out of the gate that in a city like North Vancouver, we have 60,000 people we get one or two, five, like count them on, on one hand, submissions about things that are in the budget. So it's really incredible how little people are involved in the budgeting process. And I think that's not good, but it is great for you because you can be. So let's talk about the timing of that feedback. 
Um, the budgets basically need to be in place to justify um, the tax rate for the municipality. And like I said, like this is all based on a provincial law that says, and this is right off the BC government website, um, all municipalities must adopt a property value tax bylaw each year. That, that tax bylaw has to be adopted, uh, adopted after the annual budget. Um, and then based on the revenue requirements for that budget, that's how we're gonna set the tax rate. So um, just as an example, the city of North Vancouver budget really breaks into kind of three categories. You've got an operating budget. This is about the stuff we just need on an ongoing basis. So public safety, basically fire, police. Um, some of that goes to transportation and transit. There's like the ongoing cost for running our, our recreation centers. But I think this is really the, the juicier part perhaps is the capital budget where we can see a lot of the you know, road and sidewalk infrastructure change to meet the needs um, for transportation. So moving away from that, I just want to give you a sense of what the budgeting process looks like. Um, you know, this January, um, if you're a property owner, you will have got a property assessment notice. And basically that comes from BC assessment and that lets the city know what the value of all the properties and the different um, property classifications are. And so that's the first part of the process because um, it's part of their formula they're gonna to use to define the tax rate. And I think the opportunity for you all is really to dive in in this financial plan development as I've suggested. So there will be ongoing um, engagement where the municipality will be seeking input from the community. I think in the city of North Vancouver, I think our, our budget is actually coming uh, in late January this year. And that's where you can really jump in to make sure the projects that you wanna see are in there. Um, once that plan is adopted, usually there's kind of happens over a period of about two months, um, the tax rate will be fixed, and then um, the tax notices will go out actually in May, which I kind of missed a step, to, step here, uh, and then your taxes are due in July. So that, that's kind of like the, the quick and dirty on the budget process. And I think you have a huge opportunity to get in front of that um, budgeting process right now um, and in early this year to make sure that hub educational programs are supported and that mobility infrastructure projects are included in the capital budget. And I'll just kind of close out here. Um, I think if you're gonna get projects on the capital plan, you're gonna to wanna to send a written submission. You wanna back it up by possibly attending the public budget meeting. Usually they have a town hall for that. And you wanna make sure you've been chatting with council members ahead of that budget meeting. And then you can generate awareness for what you're asking for on social media. But one thing I wanted to just leave you with is I think something that's really powerful in the budgeting process is yes, going as hub cycling, yes, sending your own letters, but really advocating um, for the stuff that we want to see um, as people that want a better world uh, through alliances with others in the community. And I think, you know, we can see that where um, hub can team up with advocates for safe streets, uh, other mobility lane users, um, it could be seniors advocates, um, advocates for people with disabilities. I did a lot of work in North Vancouver with our um, committee for, um, we have an advisory committee on disability issues. We did a lot of work with them uh, at the time that they were doing the lower level, lower limb interchanges. And then I think the other opportunity that's presenting now is advocates for green infrastructure. So we have the North Shore Stream Keepers. Um, a lot of the cycling infrastructure that's well designed can really be supportive for them. And I think when these groups all work together, we can push for the same projects uh, and it's very hard for council to see them as anything other than the great investment that they are. And of course that helps us all to ride safely. So um, yeah, I hope that, that that's a, a valuable idea for all of you tonight. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tony. I think you bring up a really important point about more partnerships. And I think that's something definitely that we could uh, do a better job on. Um, and also I really like to point on, on the funding of, of municipal budgets. It also funds education programs for hubs. So if people who might not be so interested in the infrastructure side, they might have a vested interest in, in cycling education. Um, so next, let's move on to our next speaker, Paul Kruger, who's Senior Transportation Planner for the City of Vancouver. Paul has worked with the city for 18 years on a wide range of sustainable transportation plans, policies, and projects. He was the lead planner for Transportation 2040, which is the city's long-term transportation strategy, and other career highlights include working on the Canada Line project, uh, leading engagement for the Granville Bridge, and um, 
overseeing Viva Vancouver, the city's public space innovation platform. Cycling is his main form of transportation for all kinds of trips, and you'll often see him on Vancouver streets and street paths. Uh, great. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can see you. Okay, I'm just here with me a moment. Everything's good? You see the title screen? Perfect. It's right. you. Thank you. I have all these windows popping up on my screen. Um, yeah, th um, thanks for um, for introducing me. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, times two on everything Tony just said. That was an awesome presentation, Tony. Um, I just want to stress how important you, your efforts are. And, you know, staff um, have an important role to play. But at the end of the day, our work is directed by council. And so it's really important for advocates like yourselves to communicate honestly to understand the limits of city jurisdiction while pushing for what you think is right. And so today I'll share just a, a few insights from my 18 years working at the city of Vancouver. Um, first is to um, recognize that most projects and policies have a broad range of benefits and trade-offs. So it's really helpful if you can frame messages in a way that's gonna reflect the interests of your audience. So think about the council in, in your particular jurisdiction or whoever you're advocating with. Um, and, and find find the message that speaks to where they're at. So, you know, transportation is about so much more than just mobility. Depending on your audience, you could lead with any number of messages, whether it's the economic benefits of a project, the health benefits, safety and accessibility, um, affordability and equity, public life and local commerce and community connectedness, opportunities for green infrastructure, could go on and on, but, but find what resonates with your audience. And then on that note, I would just say that um, bike infrastructure is about a lot more than just biking. And you will often hear people position cycling against walking, against public space, and even against uh, local transit. And, and usually this is a false argument, intentional or otherwise. It's really important in your advocacy efforts to counteract um, this, this particular false narrative. You know, bike infrastructure, um, by giving people a safe place to ride, protected butt lanes virtually eliminate sidewalk riding and that makes it safer and more comfortable for people who are walking. Traffic diverters, which are a key part of uh, local street bikeways and greenways can become car-free spaces that provide opportunities for park expansion, provide new public spaces, opportunities for, for patios that support local business, for green infrastructure. And, and then uh, protected lanes are also not just about cycling, but all of the new new mobility emer emerging uh, ways of getting around like e-scooters and so forth. Um, protected lanes enable shared services like that to complement mass transit and take pressure off of local bus service. So, so really, really important you, you're um, combating this false narrative. Uh, you know, there's a wealth of evidence out there to support sustainable transportation projects. It's really important to um, you know find the data that supports your message. Here's just a few quick examples that, that I've used in the past for different projects. You've probably seen this one. Many people believe bike infrastructure is about serving the people who already bike today and they think about a limited number of the population, a um, small percentage. These stats on the, on the chart here are about a dozen years old and they suggest about a quarter of the population today will, will ride a bike. Um, but we're actually targeting a much broader audience when we talk about bike infrastructure, people who are interested but concerned. And that's that's another 40 or 50 percent of the population at least. Again, this data is old. So when you factor in the growth in e-bikes and e-scooters and, and other similar ways of getting around, percentages are actually much higher. So um, um, good example of, of, of stats to help um, a message. Another example, um, some people will argue that, hey, you, you've already done a, two bike routes downtown. Good job, guys. That's enough. But actually, we have a long way to go. This chart, you know, put things in context. About 30% of our streets are dedicated to parking and only about 1% for biking. So just kind of uh, gives a sense of how far we have to go. One, one last example I'll give on using data to tell a story. Um, it, it, this chart focuses on safety, showing that people walking and biking are only involved in about 2% of collisions. 
but since they're not protected by a metal box, they account for over 50% of serious injuries. It just highlights how important it is to design for vulnerable road users. The corollary of, of that is to appeal to emotions. And as much as engineers and planners and, and even some decision makers like data, we're also human and humans are very emotional creatures. I, I say appeal to those emotions by telling compelling personal stories, but real stories from the heart. Um, getting at what Tony was saying around, you know, recognizing counselors of people first. So some perspectives from actual people that might sway a conversation. You know, a young woman who looks very healthy but can barely walk because of degenerative joint issues. She can bike though, and a network of safe routes allows her to meet her daily needs and gives her the freedom to participate in daily life. Or a new immigrant who's making ends meet by delivering food on an e-scooter. Lack of safe routes where the restaurants are, restaurants are force him to choose between riding in the dangerous parked car door zone, parked car door zone, or mixing uncomfortably with people on the sidewalk. This person and the company he works for could be powerful advocates for protected lanes on commercial high streets. Or just thinking about people coping with the insanely high cost of housing by living car light or car free lifestyles. A robust network of safe, practical bike routes can mean the difference between staying in Vancouver or leaving. Stories can get a lot more painful too. I'm thinking about people who've lost loved ones. It's a sad state of affairs that some critical projects in the region have only gotten attention after someone's been killed in traffic. I don't need to name some of these projects. Probably many of you in the room know what some of these are, um, but, but it's important to, to, to speak from the heart and, and, and connect on a human level the projects that you are um, advocating for. Use photos and images to support your message. Um, I don't need to explain this one, really pictures with a thousand words. This photo sequence focuses on people riding on the sidewalk when they don't have a safe alternative. If you never ride a bike, but you care about pedestrian safety, you should probably be an advocate for complete streets and safe cycling, cycling infrastructure where the destinations are. There's also great stats on, on this particular point, by the way, um, you know, on the, on the Granville Bridge, for example, where there are not safe facilities yet, over half of people bike on the sidewalk. On the Broad Bridge, where we have safe facilities, it's less than 1%. Refer to actual precedents if you can. So here are two great examples of a complete street, one in North Vancouver, Esplanade. Um, which came on the heels of someone passing away, I, I might add. Um, and then uh, another example in Europe. Um, more and more successful examples exist and oftentimes exist locally. You don't have to travel far to experience them. So Tony was saying, you know, meet someone for a coffee or meet someone for a coffee on one of these streets, I would say. Um, counselors also, there are counselors out there that like to keep up with the Joneses or, or better yet, one up, up them. Um, you might know Vancouver has an 11% road space reallocation target. That actually, why 11% you wonder? Are, are, are people just really big fans of Spinal Tap? Actually, um, New West passed a 10% reallocation target. And so the city came out with 11%. So, you know, we're human. No shame in shaming people a little sometimes to get what you want. Use inclusive language and include and, and avoid othering when you can. Um, so there's a tendency sometimes to define people how, how they get around a cyclist or a pedestrian or a motorist. As much as you can, um, tr try to get, a, get away from that. We're all people first. Um, not everyone would call themselves a cyclist, but many people would ride a bike if you make it really safe and really convenient. And just to add to that, if you can, try not to be accusatory in tone when you're when you're talking with decision makers, even if you're coming from a very different political perspective. Um, if you can frame things in a way that saves face and allows decision makers and others to change their mind about something without making their core constituency look bad, um, that that allows them to, to to change their mind publicly and make them feel good about it even. Uh, lastly, I would say, uh, I think Tony spoke to this as well, coordinate with other advocates. If possible, um, 
you know, work with, with other groups who maybe have different perspectives, um, who can speak from the heart to deliver honest, inspired, balanced, persuasive, multi-pronged messages. So, you know, in particular, find, find some of those groups that might be stereotypically generalized as opposing active transportation projects. So seniors and, and, and families with young children or persons with disabilities, delivery people, business owners, um, and, and, and find people who can speak persuasively and honestly uh, on, the, on the projects. Yeah, I could keep going, but I think I'll just leave it there and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, next up, we are going to hear from, uh, not last, uh, from Mike Tancredi, oh, yeah. one of the founders of the Skaters of the North Shore Advocacy Group. And the group was founded in early 2023 by brothers Evan and Mike Tancredi, primarily in response to the imminent demolition of the Lonsdale Skate Park in North Vancouver. With less than two weeks notice, the group rallied the North Shore and broader skateboarding community, gathering nearly 5,000 signatures to support saving the skate park. Unfortunately, their efforts were not enough to stop the demolition, but they did successfully secure additional funding and accelerated the completion of a smaller skate park. It's also solidified them as an undeniable community voice representing a diverse population contingent. And since then, skaters of the North Shore have been busy securing a covered winter skate park and developing plans for current skate park improvements while fostering strong relationships with council members and district staff. So um, I'm just gonna ask Paul to stop sharing his screen. Oh, and Mike, are you there? Great, hi Mike. I'm there, how's Me? it going? Thanks for coming, uh, over to you. Sure, it's just me. There's uh, no screen to share here tonight, and uh, unfortunately, my brother uh, couldn't make the uh, the meeting here today. But uh, yeah, to reiterate, uh, based on the uh, the summary there, we actually formed in uh, 2022, early 2022, and uh, we formed out of necessity and sort of an imminent and very significant community change, which was as stated earlier, the uh, demolition of one of the most popular skate parks uh, in the broader skate community uh, across Metro Vancouver. Uh, we had about 11 days notice, um, which uh, that's a whole other story, but that immediacy and uh, significance uh, allowed us to get everybody's attention really quickly, far and wide across not only Vancouver and the, the the province, but across the country, people that had visited the skate park uh, have become much beloved in the last 20 years that it's been in place. And uh, although we uh, weren't successful in halting that or even getting much of an extension on the use of the park, um, we did create uh, quite a... a political stir and garnered quite a lot of attention from local media, uh, news media, radio stations, TV, and uh, the politicians and city council, of course. Uh, we had we had their ear and that um, presence directly resulted in a much smaller skate park being expanded, um, a few hundred thousand dollars extra in funding allocated to that project and uh, a place in the minds of, of council and in our community. So unfortunately, it did take something kind of uh, traumatic and uh, unfortunate, still still kind of reeling from the loss of that shared space to bring the community together and really focus our efforts on a single cause. And uh, over the intervening couple of years that we've we've continued, um, we've really focused on directing our community's attention and energy and political focus towards one issue at a time. And I know we're we're much smaller um, jurisdiction. We're just talking skateboarding on the North Shore compared to Hub, um, but uh, these things are are. Um, We've we've learned that the the more micro and focused we can we can get uh, very granular. So at the moment we're focusing on a single location covered skate park, 
uh, it's much easier to have people show up to council meetings, engage with social media, uh, or volunteer to help as opposed to much broader initiatives. Um, and that was our sort of main takeaway. And I look forward to uh, any questions people may have. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, I live right near your skate park and I've, I've just been amazed at how quickly you were able to kind of pivot and, and get that skate park, park built after they demolished the one by uh, okay. Rome. Um, so we just have some questions from the audience. Let me just uh, go through. The first one is uh, Anthony from our local Vancouver local committee asks, uh, Tony, can you repeat the part about one to five people providing input to the city of North Vancouver budget? I heard that and it sounds super important. Can you expand on that a bit more? There we go, Tony's unmuted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think what I was trying to say is that like we don't have a lot of feedback on the budget. I'm, I, it's actually kind of horrific. I mean, if you think about a city and the amount of effort we put into trying to engage folks, um, we, we would expect to have a lot more feedback on the budget and the things that come forward, but we just don't have it. So I think it's a huge opportunity for people that are in this call as advocates um, to make sure they're getting in front of council at budget time when it really matters. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is for Paul. Uh, you mentioned that Vancouver has an 11% reallocation target. Is it possible to find out how they're planning to reallocate this space? Huh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that was the it was the previous council that that made that direction. And so it's, I would say that's something you can put in, in any submission, but I probably wouldn't lean too heavily on that. But how, how can you reallocate road space? Well, by by looking at a lot of our on-street parking and a lot of our general traffic travel lanes, and that could be wider sidewalks, that could be protected lanes for cycling and micro mobility, that could be green infrastructure, um, all kinds of things. Thanks, Paul. Um, and Mike, I actually have a question for you. Um, I, you guys have a great social media presence um, on Instagram, and I'm not yeah. sure. Twitter or any of the other social media platforms, but your social media campaign is pretty powerful. Do you mind uh, just kind of going into that for a bit, explaining to our audience what that looks like, how you came up with the idea, and if that has had any influence on your advocacy campaigns or how it's sure, yeah. campaigns? Yeah, absolutely. So there's uh, there's four sort of core members uh, that, that look after most of that, myself being one of them. And um, there was a little bit of a hit and miss and experimentation with different types of posts to see um, what people would respond to and what would result in um, community action, I guess, for lack of a better term, and people showing up to council meetings or demonstrations. And um, we found that a, a blend of um, sort of more lighthearted, uh, fun posts, such as we started to profile uh, local community members. We have got quite a diverse community, as I'm sure Hub does, from you know young children to senior citizens and everything in between, uh, with a with a sort of a weekly feature that we call Skater of the North Shore, uh, in, in recognition of our name, where we ask people questions and sort of uh, the same questions every week around what they'd like to see different and what they what they like already. Just to echo what Tony was saying. We try to keep the tone more or less uh, positive and not adversarial and more focus on what we do have and what can be improved upon as opposed to what's going wrong. Um, and then that coupled with um, bits and pieces of the history of our community, uh, sort of prominent community members. And then when the time comes, because of that engagement, we have quite a uh, number of eyes on our page when we do need people to show up for a council meeting or a demonstration, we found that like, as we develop these other types of posts, um, the turnout for all of those things has been probably double. Like the last uh, council meeting, we were in a, the district of North Vancouver. We had about 30 community members outside of the presenters show up for the delegation. Um, which was about three times what, what we had got previously, so. 
And I know most hub local committees are jealous of those numbers because I don't know if we get those numbers very often to council meetings. So that's that's an amazing feat. Um, yeah, Kathy, I, I know yeah. this isn't really a panel, but I just want to say, like, as a counselor, when this like the skaters of the North Shore showed up to council, oh. I would say in council's mind, as a generalization that's not accurate at all, it was, oh, these are a bunch of teenagers that want to ride their skateboards. And how wrong we were. There were people of all different nationalities, all different ages, uh, people in their 60s skateboarding. Um, and what was really clear from the community, like that skating community, was that they support each other. And like when council saw that, I would say it was almost impossible for us to say no to what they were asking for. So um, I just wanted to add to, to Mike's points. Yeah, and uh, if you follow like the local newspaper, you'll you'll see that you guys have a really big presence there, despite the fact that you haven't been around very long. So you've definitely made an impact. Um, uh, so Melanie asks, the lack of secure bike spaces inhibits people from regular cycling. Is there a way to address this problem? That's a broad question. Does anybody want to try and answer that? Or I think it was in reference to to Paul's presentation? Is that too much to, to bite off? Yeah. In this? <laughs> it's a big question. Um, are you referring to, to like secure bike parking or just space allocated to cycling generally? I think she's referring to secure bike spaces. So I think like secure I, overall, I think off. it's I think it's just in general safer streets for bike. Mm -hmm. I may hold off on that. I think my answer would be take up the rest of the meeting, <laughs> meeting okay. I think, but but it's a really critical thing that just just to note that we have so far to go off. Oft times, you know, you hear at least in the city of Vancouver, like everyone is in support, everyone recognizes that everybody is a pedestrian, everyone walks at least for part of their journey. And so yes, I support walking. Most councillors, at least in the city of Vancouver, would support that. Where cycling depends on the council, depends on a bunch of factors. But um, the reality is, our in Vancouver, our walking network is quite robust, um, but our cycling network is very nascent and has a long way to go. And so, I think that's a thing you could point out with data, you could point out with just you know visualizations in terms of like what what percentage of streets are safe to bike on versus walk on. But but I would also want to be just to contradict what I just said. So you don't, don't want to pit walking versus cycling. These, inf these infrastructure pieces are, are usually mutually supportive. Oh, so if you, to, to bike parking you're referencing. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a big one. Keep keep advocating for, for more secure bike parking. I don't, I don't disagree. Um, and think outside the box, things like um, TransLink has their bike parkade program, but I know they're interested in looking at higher levels of security, particularly with, you know, uh, bike thieves having cordless angle grinders and things like that, it's harder and harder to, to actually have secure bike parking. But even, you know, bike valet programs, there are cities that are, are making, you know, are piloting valet programs and, and in some cases making them permanent. And so um, you know, Vancouver does a little bit of this, but could certainly go further. And I think other jurisdictions as well. So so get, point to the good examples that are already happening and, and, and advocate for it. Hey, thanks, Mike. Um... Paul, this question is to, for you again. Um, how do you maintain good relationships with staff when you think their proposed plans could be more ambitious? Oh, I, I would say I'm I'm delighted when I hear members of the public push. Just recognize staff are often between an rock and a hard place. People pushing us on both sides. Oftentimes, you know, what what at the end of the day, staff are kind of working under the direction of council. So uh, staff might want to go further but might not be getting that direction from senior management because of all of the political machinations so as long as you you know don't don't attack people personally don't make it personal make it about the issue so if, if you can frame an issue frame it as an issue not a personal attack and frame it in a constructive way and um then then i think you're fine like that's i i would hope you do that okay thanks uh paul um, and then for for Mike, uh, somebody says they might have missed it, but it sounds like you united with other groups. Uh, did did you unite with other groups? And if so, could you mention a few of those groups and how you kind of work together? This goes back to Tony's 
point of of working with more partnerships. That's, that's me, Mike. Yeah. yeah that's okay. You. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, uh, directly, we did not really uh, partner with any other groups outside of the skateboarding community. Um, there were some within it, for example, a Spectrum Skateboard Society, which is a nonprofit run on the North Shore um, uh, skateboarding camps for autistic children. And um, they are also in the same bout as the broader community with nowhere to facilitate lessons and events during the winter months, which is our sort of primary problem here on the North Shore with the weather. Um, but it was mostly contained within the skateboard community, unless Tony has something to add to that. I'm not sure that I uh, missed anything there. I, I, yeah, I, I don't think so, Mike. I think that, that's a pretty good, pretty good summary. Okay. Okay, um, thanks. And this is from Jeff Lee to Paul and Tony. Uh, he says sometimes we see advocate we see we sometimes see advocates focusing on staff when elected officials aren't supportive, or on elected officials when staff aren't supportive. Can you speak to whether it's important to have both teams on board and how and how that can come about? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, I I would say take a double pronged effort and advocate both ways. Like do, there are there are friendly staff, and I know. Hub works hard and has good relations with certain staff. I hope to include myself among that group. Um, and you know, if you speak with me, I, I'll give, certainly give you my perspective as, as honestly and, and diplomatically as I can. But but uh, you know, definitely um, it goes both both sides. Uh, City of Vancouver has a lot of staff, a lot of different perspectives within within our organization, even within teams, and so. So again, like focus on the issues, not the person. Um, talk with the staff, um, and and advocate also to to uh, the political powers that be. I would say with the political powers that be, you, you you know, Jeff, I know you have so much experience on this, like understanding where they're coming from, and like you, you got a sense of an understanding of like what levers might they be more responsive to. So you can probably strategically tailor a message to in a way that might resonate with them a little more. So like city of Vancouver, you know, this council, um, they're very interested in micromobility and e-scooters and good walking environment and public space that supports local business. Those are all things that good cycling infrastructure complements. And so there's a lot to work with there. I think I, I wonder if I could add to No. Go ahead, Mike. Oh. Oh, am I on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I just wanted to add, like in our experience, uh, one thing to keep in mind about who you talk to, um, the scale of what you're asking for is really a, a good filter to start with. Um, the scale maybe on the financial side of what the ask might be for the particular um, initiative that you have. We've had some smaller um, improvements to local facilities. Um in the hundreds or thousands of dollars that we've gone directly to staff with and um, have the luxury of bypassing the political process and getting motions and um, swaying a political will one way or the other, uh, which we didn't really know was possible until we started doing this. So I'd say like, if you do have smaller scale initiatives like bike repair facilities and whatnot, you may be able to foster strong enough relationships directly with staff that if you have their ear, they do have some leeway and flexibility about what they're able to approve without going through the whole um, process with, with council. That's... I just wanted to add as well, like as a counselor, like, so this is really, I think this might be interesting for folks, like as a counselor, like I want to know. So of course I want you to come talk to me. But, and I, and I, as a counselor, like, I'll never say no to somebody coming to tell me, like, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I'm worried about. But I do also remember that when I was chair of Hub Cycling on the North Shore, I spent a lot of time building my relationship with staff. And sometimes, sometimes we got frustrated on certain things, and we did go to council, and we kind of got our hands, I don't want to say slapped, but that is the word that comes to my, to my mind at the time. 
And so I, we did learn to be, uh, eventually kind of came to this point where like the director of engineering was like, hey, Tony, like if you guys are gonna send a letter, like why don't you just give me a call first? Like I just, I, you know, I'm not saying don't send a letter, but just let me know, keep me in the loop. And it got to the point where really, obviously I was just phoning him and I was like, hey, Doug, um, you know what? Like we're gonna send a letter on this. Like we've been talking about it for a long time. This has been a concern for us. Um, we feel like we need to do this. And, and, you know, that really helped the relationship. And again, it always goes back to those relationships. So. Thanks, Tony and Mike. Um, we have a question from Bruce, who I believe is in our story committee. And uh, I just lost his question on my screen. But uh, he was asking um, about the budget process. And if a municipality, for example, didn't fund hub cycling education programs in school, as some municipalities don't, are there any tips for advocating to municipal councils in support of education programs in schools, as opposed for advocating for capital funding and for infrastructure? I just think like when it comes to education, like, you know, usually everybody, regardless of, you know, what their thoughts are about cycling, like education is always key. And like, I don't, um, I don't think it's really easy for council to say no to supporting education. So um, I think maybe going to look at the benefits of that and what that means in terms of people um, growing up with a lived experience around cycling, I think that that's a very good way to start. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Tony. I would also say like Hub, Hub is a great re resource for this. And I know like personally knowing, uh, you know, Rose and Laura on, on this call who um, have kind of, worked kind of either side of this at various points. And so um, um, I would say talk talk to them. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have time for one more question um, for Tony and potentially Paul. Speaking regarding Vancouver Council, how much weight do you put on people speaking at meetings regarding motions versus sending an email? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it seems like counselors tune out with frustratingly long speaker list. I, 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 Tony, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, well, I guess I would say that, like, um, I do find, and it depends. It, it it depends on the context. Like, if it's a hundred people signed up to say the same thing, I would say, yeah, I, it definitely you do tune out. But it depends what the purpose is, and it was kind of going back to like that hierarchy that I had in my presentation. I think if you want to build a connection and build a relationship, speaking is not the way. But if there's something coming before council and you want to support it, showing up in person, I, I, I certainly think that that does add a lot of weight. Um, I, I try not as a counselor to put too much weight to, oh, this person showed up in, in, in person versus, oh, that was an email because sometimes people can't come in person for a variety of reasons. So you, know, you don't want to like prejudice your decisions that way. But, you know, sometimes you see, you can feel like there's a, a group that shows up. And I, I, I again, I'll, I'll hands up to Mike and the skaters in our shore, like they definitely showed up and had a presence at council when, when it was time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, th I think both are important. One of the benefits to coming in person is, uh, and I don't disagree, I saw uh, <laughs> Anthony or an equity comment there in, in, in the chat, it's hard for people to come in person, but it is it is kind of public record. And so, you know, if the media is gonna report on something like, an issue might get 50 emails and the media won't sniff that out. Um, but if it's a matter of public record and the media is there, they'll pick up on that. And so I've seen, uh, you know, advocates come together and, and speak passionately and knowledgeably from a broad range of perspectives. And, and uh, at times that has influenced the decision. I've also been there on the floor as staff and watching, like it didn't make a difference this time. Not, weren't they listening? But, but I think, as an advocate, I hope, hope you continue to do so. Okay, and then we just have one final quick question from Jenny in Maple Ridge, and this is for Paul. How would you suggest that local committee get staff to meet with them when we're consistently told that they're too busy to meet with us? I can't speak to the staff there. Um, yeah, I'm curious if like which staff, maybe you're not reaching the right staff member if you talk to the, a different person you might get a different response um, but I'm not familiar with the staff in, in, in your jurisdiction so I can't speak to that but um I'm glad I'm glad you're trying Tony any thoughts or any others I feel like this? Paul I feel like 
that's where you go to the politicians at that point. Oh yeah, that that's good. So if if you get the ear of a politician, they will tell staff, "Hey, you need to respond to this." Okay. All right. Well, um, we're right on time, so that's uh, all the time we have right now unfortunately for questions, but we really appreciate you, Tony, Paul, and Mike for joining us this evening. And um, I that there's lots of important lessons from all your presentations and from the Q&A that our local committees and the other advocates on the call will take forward and, and be able to use in their work. Um, so feel free to log off now and, uh, and uh, we're gonna move on to the next part of our session, um, which is, we're just gonna have a quick five minute break so you can grab a drink. Um, or get some food, and then we will reconvene here at 7.55. Thank you. I really appreciate Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back. We're now going to move to the interactive discussion portion of the workshop. Uh, Anthony Floyd, who's the co-chair of the Vancouver Local Committee, is going to give an introduction to our workshop discussion topic, which is how can you use your committee's priority gaps or proposed projects in your municipality in the annual budget planning process. Uh, after Anthony's presentations, you'll be sent uh, to a discussion room with a moderator who will help facilitate the breakout um, room discussions. And uh, we'll have 15 minutes in there, and then we'll reconvene in a main room where uh, the moderators will be giving a short summary, or the, the moderators of the groups will be giving a short summary of each um, group's discussion. Uh, Anthony's been an integral member of the Vancouver Local Committee for a long time, and he's now the committee's co-chair along with Jeff Flea. And he's going to share with us how the Vancouver Local Committee has been staying engaged in developing the, the development of the municipal budget. So Anthony. Um, Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. All right. OK, so as Kathy said, she has asked me to introduce the workshop topic, and I will try to get through the slides that I have here quickly. Fortunately, uh, they uh, reflect a lot of what was already said by Paul, um, Mike, and Tony. So uh, I can skip over some things. But basically, I'm going to cover a little bit how city budgets work, which, of course, Tony talked about, the types of budgets, uh, where we draw our priorities from for the budget, and um, how we've uh, how we've been using how our committee has been in, you know, taking advantage of the relationships we have to try to put things on the agenda. So budgets, Vancouver style, of course, because it's all from our perspective here. Money comes in, they get money mostly from property taxes, a little bit from fees, parking and fines, and so on, and money goes out. Um, but of course, there are two ways that money goes out in Vancouver. At least there's an operating budget and a capital budget. Uh, operating budget goes towards things that happen day to day, like fire and rescue services, uh, road maintenance, engineering, utilities, and so on. Capital budget are building things, infrastructure. Um, and so you have to be, you know, very painfully aware of what falls under which uh, budget. Uh, the capital budget is affected by the capital plan. So what is the capital? plan then. The capital plan is uh, something that occurs in four-year cycles in Vancouver, and staff works with council to provide recommendations for capital projects. Uh, and interesting to note, this is maintenance of existing infrastructure, as well as introducing new uh, projects and new infrastructure um, in what should be a unified and strategic plan. Uh, currently, we're in year two of the 2023-2026 capital plan in Vancouver. And of course, part of this capital plan is dedicated to active transportation. Uh, this year, uh, as part of our council's direction through their Climate Emergency Action Plan, SEEP, um, staff were directed to present an active mobility plan. In the past, they've presented a cycling plan or variations on that topic. Uh, this year, it's called the Active Mobility Plan, which includes walking, rolling, and cycling. And so the AMP, the Active Mobility Plan, uh, provides some near-term infrastructure priorities, so uh, reasonably quick. Um, for uh, topics that fall under SEEP, uh, as well as building off of the 2018-22 cycling network plan, which is the previous cycling plan. Now, there are a whole bunch of different directions and directives and plans that uh, contribute to this. Uh, we heard a little bit that uh, Paul uh, was key and integral to the Transportation 2040 plan that Vancouver developed a few years ago. Uh, there's SEEP, there's the recently developed Vancouver plan, and the big thing that we need to note is that this section of the budget, uh, this active mobility plan, it's just a plan. And the previous cycling plan had less than a 50% completion rate. So they laid out their priorities, they laid out the projects they wanted to do and completed less than 50% of that. Um, you know, priorities get shuffled around due to political influence. We heard a lot about how uh, it's very important to um, have, uh, you know, appeal to both uh, politicians and staff, things that are interested to them, interesting to them. Um, and of course, as councils change, um, those interests change. And in the end, it comes down to money. Not enough money in the current capital plan to fully complete uh, everything that's detailed in the AMP. There wasn't enough in the previous plan either. Uh, and here's just a, a quick glimpse at what uh, that active mobility plan is. There are some pedestrian improvements. There's something that Vancouver calls complete streets, and then there are greenways. 
So where does our advocacy fit into the city budgeting? The very first thing you have to decide is what is it you're trying to accomplish? Is it a big thing? Is it a small thing? We heard Mike talk about that a little bit. Um, how might the city pay for the thing you're trying to get them to do? Is it operational? If it's operational, it's likely to happen faster. And it's unlikely to be a permanent change. It's likely to be a temporary change. It can't cost much money because uh, staff have to fit it under their own budgets. Some examples are the uh, Beach Avenue uh, um, improvement here in Vancouver, some Stanley Park work, uh, and uh, the temporary uh, um, barricades on the Canby Street Bridge. Now, capital plan, those are the bigger projects. Or sorry, capital projects, those are the bigger ones. Now, they have to fit in the capital plan. And if it doesn't, then you're lobbying to get it into the next capital plan. If it doesn't fall within the capital plan, you're not going to get a lot of people paying attention to you. But at the same time, sometimes things seem like they're not in the plan, but you might be able to have some outside the box thinking to show that actually, well, this does fit within the plan. And the time frame here for the capital things are years. And so some examples there are the Arbutus Greenway improvement, the Kitts Beach changes, the Granville Street connector, and again, Stanley Park changes. And how can you advocate? Uh, and we've heard all these things before, and I'm happy to hear that. So get to know the staff, engineering, planning, the different departments. Get to know who's responsible for what. Get to know the engineers, the planners, and the managers, and arrange face-to-face -face meetings, like Tony was saying. Get to know the elected, so you can identify friendly counselors, identify their pet issues, and see how those issues fit with your concerns. Send letters and arrange meetings, again, to advocate for your issue. And electeds will apply pressure sometimes and set the direction for staff. You have to be prepared. You have to come with facts and figures. You can't just come with emotion. You have to come with details. You have to be able to show specific points and demonstrate it and back it up. And often you have to be ready for questions like, well, what would you do? Where do you think there are gaps? What are the most important issues for you? Above all, be consistent in your messages and priorities. Mike was saying they're picking one particular item and they're focusing on it and they're drilling on it. And that is a good way of getting things together. And lastly, be relentless. Keep repeating your message. Keep reminding staff and electeds with existing plans and how they should be fulfilling them. Um, and so here we go. Here's an example of what the Vancouver Local Committee has been doing. Uh, there is the uh, the gap list. I think every local committee has access to the gap list. It's not just Vancouver. It covers the whole uh, Metro Vancouver area. And that's a living document. Maintain uh, you know, what your priorities are for gaps in infrastructure. Um, the VULC has recently uh, brought together a set of advocacy guiding principles so that we can be consistent in our messaging. We have regular meetings with staff, Paul and his um, his, uh, his co-workers, as well as uh, uh, some friendly communications meetings with some of the electeds. Um, we're usually identified as a stakeholder in most planning activities, and we're invited uh, often early in those planning activities to provide feedback and some guidance. Uh, and it's important to be able to get into those uh, planning activities to the fullest extent possible. Uh, and it's important to keep track of all the different plans in play to identify when staff are not meeting those goals and push both through meetings and letters gently but firmly. So just a couple of final thoughts here. Getting things in the budget is hard. It's hard. Make friends with staff and electeds. Even if you don't like them, make friends with them. Play the long game. Have patience. Be prepared. Do your homework. And I want to just indicate, you know, this is advocacy, not a activism. Activism has a place that's, you know, reacting to something right now and 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 raising a a, a um, you know a point uh, in the public's uh, mind, in the press, online. That's activism. It, sometimes you can get a quick change there. The stuff I've been talking about here, and the stuff I think we've been talking about all night, is advocacy, which is more of a long game. So that's my introduction. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was a great um, summary. And uh, I'll be sure to share Anthony's presentation. There's some additional slides there that he didn't get to present, but they're also very useful. So I'll send that around in a follow-up email. Um, all right, we're gonna now put you into breakout rooms and please bear with us. Uh, we haven't done this before <laughs> with such a big group, so it might take a few minutes, so hopefully not a few minutes, but um, we'll try to do that right now. And then while we're doing that, feel free to chat amongst yourselves and, and say hi to people. Since we had some technical problems where we got kicked out much sooner than we intended to, and I'm going to pass it back to Kathy if she has some insights. Um, I can, how many more minutes now do you need? 
Um, well, we were in a very wonderful conversation. So uh, how do I, uh, I have some feedback from my group, but uh, are other moderators ready to share feedback? Uh, I'm, I can share some. We can add five yeah. minutes and we'd be running over. I'm not sure if people need to. You could carry we, it on. Yeah. yeah, we wrapped up as well. Yeah, well, well, we can we can present as well, please. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this you is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take over, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna invite all our moderators uh, to sum up uh, the discussion in their room in two minutes. Um, and what I'm gonna start is I'm gonna share the speaking order uh, to share this. Um, feedback so that others have time uh, to put some thoughts together while Jeff takes this on first and presents the feedback from his room. Well, it was a, it was a little bit rushed, so I'm not sure if I have two minutes of uh, synthesized uh, consolidated uh, reporting, but we talked about um, the importance of a priority list uh, and Neil and Delta talked about that and the, the fact they're updating it and they're getting it in front of staff. They're not just using it themselves. Um, we had discussions about the importance of playing the long game, a theme that came out tonight from uh, our presenters. Uh, we had an initial conversation about uh, press and using the media. And if you're using media, um, what's the end game? Are you doing it to build public support? Are you doing it, and in this case, it was to influence counselors and, and, and bring, make sure they're aligned with community values and community, community sentiment. Um, and the importance of thanking those counselors through that medium as well. Um, we had another discussion about, uh, about uh, having a very strong relationship with staff and make, having to make sure that uh, the elected official relationships uh, were brought along as well. And one of the things that was done to, to raise the, uh, um, raise the uh, level of engagement was an assessment ride, uh, raising the profile of an issue and staff are already making work on changing uh, uh, in response to that. Um, we had a conversation about the contrast between advocacy and activism and um, uh, making sure that the long-term relationships are protected when sometimes activism begins to um, be, be more a part of it. And we talked about uh, budget requests and ensuring that things are built to AAA and making sure that staff are kept on board and the relationships are there if, we, if they feel they're being asked to do things that weren't in their plan. So, so those are the things we covered in the time that we had. All right, thanks, Jeff. I will um, jump in then. Our group um, reiterated some of the things you were talking about, but also some other points were around um, updating the priority list based on staff feedback or sort of opportunities that were coming up um, to kind of align with what uh, staff were letting them know. Again, updating that gap list, um, but um, also recognizing the importance of having um, one or more liaisons. In the case of the North Shore, there was three different municipalities to work with, and that because folks are volunteers, they their energies go up and down um, or their engagement. And so having multiple people for each municipality, um, also different kinds of advocacy, not necessarily just on gaps or priorities, but also on improvements in the case of Vancouver to local bikeways um, and maintenance and other sort of ongoing issues that you can advocate on, even if perhaps in the current sort of political climate, it may be difficult to get bigger projects. Um, and then one of the members from the Richmond committee um, was talking about how the staff have a great uh, plan, but that the, their advocacy is really focused on how to accelerate that and looking at opportunities, again, kind of coming back to our budget around um, where there's already um, some kind of infrastructure changes like repaving or we also talked about green infrastructure, as Tony mentioned, where can we integrate cycling into those existing um, capital projects and get kind of quicker changes? That's it for my group. I'll pass it over to you, Laura.
Queen's Roads. Um, yeah, we had a good uh, good discussion. It went by very quick, um, but we talked, uh, a couple committees talked about what they might do moving forward uh, to ensure the budget process uh, isn't missed uh, during the year. So uh, one committee member, for example, said that they maybe they'll designate someone on the committee to monitor the budget, um, be responsible for kind of um, ensuring that, uh, that they don't miss the boat and that they know what the budget cycle and timing is. Um, we talked a bit about barriers. Um, uh, one uh, local committee rep brought up um, that when they're advocating for kind of more regional infrastructure, it might be more effective for the hub team uh, to reach out for those more regional issues like TransLink and for regional budgets. Um, and then in terms of, we talked a bit about how uh, they are currently prioritizing what to advocate for and, and one uh, representative from the Richmond committee, for example, said they do a bit of a mix. Uh, they sometimes get emails from members with concerns, um, and they also do assessment rides. And that's it uh, on uh, from me, and I will pass it over to whoever hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. I can I can jump in next. Our our uh, group focused a bit more on how to how to ramp up and get involved in the budgeting process. As a lot of the committees in our uh, in our room hadn't been as involved in actually being uh, connected to the budget. So we talked about the importance of building those relationships with staff, whether they're engineering staff or planning staff, um, and sort of getting those connections in and, and the importance of beginning involved with different committees that are related to transportation. So several of the, of the committees are involved in like the transportation or active transportation committees and the importance of being involved with those committees to understand more of the process and to build some of those connections and relationships with staff that you can then use to get more involved in the actual planning process for the for the budgets. Um, and then just the importance of being able to leverage those relationships to, to learn more about projects sort of ahead of when they come out for a um, request for proposal or come out to the, the public stage of engagement. Um, but the but in in our group there was definitely a lot of questions about how to get started on that. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for hub to provide resources for our local committees on sort of a step by step on how to how to move from not being as involved with the budgeting process to be able to to ramp it up and and be involved in that going forward. Um, yeah, uh, that's basically it, it for our room. I think it's over to Nav in room five. Thank. You. I think I'm going before enough, so I will hop right in. Um, thanks. Uh, so um, our group consisted of folks from uh, the North Shore, Tri-Cities, and Langley local committees. Um, and I would say we the broader theme of our um, conversation was really about effective advocacy. Um, so the North Shore, uh, a member of the North Shore committee um, had noted that, you know, when they approach advocacy, they try to focus and hone down on, on um, a few really key priority gap areas that are especially connected to um, um, uh, busy areas where there's a lot of um, community services, um, where people live, generally speaking, and try to advocate for those core um, infrastructural areas and then build out. Um, so they did this by focusing on three priority bikeways um, and uh, having it so that they're they're going about it in a very tangible way. Um, we also spoke about how, um, you know, sometimes when um, you're advocating uh, planners, for instance, transportation planners, that's work they're doing every single day. So they're really focused in on that. So sometimes that's more effective to um, get the attention of um, uh, city staff rather than councillors, since councillors have so many different priorities. Um, and uh, another thing we we chat about, you know, a way to uh, uh, get um, uh, city staff or councillors engaged is, is taking them on um, assessment rides. And um, uh, one of the members mentioned that, you know, what's often really effective is when they go on these rides and you say, you know, you're at an intersection um, and, and you actually get them to have to, to press a button and, and get off their bike, then they really see, you know, where the, those gaps are. Um, and then lastly, uh, uh, one of the members mentioned that um, what's really important uh, for the capital budget is to get the city councillors on board because ultimately they're, they're the final decision makers. And that was about it. 
Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, I had in my room uh, people from the North Shore, from Surrey, White Rock, and Victoria. Um, and it was such a wonderful um, experience to listen to. They were such different experiences. Uh, what we talked about was um, staying again engaged with the elected officials, staff, as well as any transportation subcommittee that you might have in municipalities so that you are listening to all their needs. Um, building a strong relationship with staff so that you don't have to use your political capital every time you want to push a project forward. Um, and one of the committees uh, mentioned that they have built such a strong relationship with the staff that they can quite often just work with the staff without having to go to the politicians. Um, a committee also talked about uh, the importance of maintaining a priority list uh, so that you can bring up this list when you're talking to the municipal um, stakeholders. But they also talked about using a map so that you can very easily visualize the gaps and then show the impact of these gaps, how this gap can impact the whole region. Um, uh, one committee uh, uh, uses a special communication method to work on just their planning. Uh, they use a Discord channel, but the people on that channel, all they are doing is budget. They are focused on budget. They have a whole bunch of people who are very uh, focused on budget related things. So that's what they do. They, they focus on that. Uh, those were some of the learnings from our groups. And I'll take a moment uh, to invite anybody else if we miss something that their local committee is really good at and they wanna jump in, uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, and share. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna take that as a sign that our moderators did a amazing job in getting the conversation going and getting out as much knowledge as possible. Um, I re really want to thank you all you, to spend this evening with us um, and listen to our presentations. Um, and I hope you could take uh, some lessons from this session. Uh, and on behalf of everyone at Hub, um, we'd like to like this is a huge thanks to our local committee members, our volunteers, uh, without whom we couldn't have achieved any of our advocacy events over the last quarter century. So you know, all you local committee members are amazing people that everyone in your committee really, really appreciates. Um, we will be sending this recording along with the presentation to all of you um, very soon. And uh, we will let the local committee chairs uh, share it with their local committees as they see fit. Um, I want to once again take a moment to thank our presenters. I know they have left, but it was so wonderful to listen to Paul, Tony, and Mike, uh, and um, Anthony's introduction to our um, workshop. Thank you so much. Uh, before uh, we take off, I want to quickly uh, bring in Laura, a new ED. Uh, most of uh, you already know her, uh, but if you haven't, uh, you haven't met her, uh, Laura is here online with us. And uh, I'm, 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 Laura, would you be so kind to just say a couple of words to our local committee volunteers? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Nav. Thanks, Kathy, for organize, uh, organizing this and, and bringing us together and to the moderators and obviously to all of you amazing volunteers uh, for doing the work that you do. Um, I have just been in this role a week <laughs> so far, um, but it feels really great to be back at Hub and this is just a really nice uh, way to kind of um, just start uh, being back here and hearing what everybody's doing and thinking about what we can maybe do better in the future to, to get better infrastructure across the region. So yeah, really excited to be here. Don't hesitate to reach out if ever you want to chat um, about anything. I'm also here to hopefully uh, support you as well um, as you help to you know build those strong relationships with your um, you know, with your elected officials, for example. So, um, so yeah, just excited to be here and uh, Hopefully I will see you at a future hub event or at an assessment ride or, or something soon. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, none of this work would have been possible had it not been for Kathy's amazing hard work and organizing and shepherding us along. So thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, we are so, so proud of all the work you do. Um, with that, I'm gonna cap it off. Thank you, goodbye. I'll stick around. If anybody have any questions, feel free to uh, speak up or post them in the chat. Uh, otherwise have a wonderful rest of the year. Thank you everyone.